put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. System Shock Video Game Review. The year is 2072. You are a nameless hacker caught hacking into the Citadel Station. It's a space station, multi-level space station, with elevators between the various floors, including floors such as maintenance, engineer, executive, and each floor is distinct to the, the others, and you can tell even without necessarily looking at the you know, checking what floor you're on, you can often tell by looking at, you know, your surroundings. And the elevator has cheesy elevator music. The, the game has a sense of humor without it taking away from the creepy tone. And the, like the second one, this has several levels and you go, you know, you revisit some of them. You don't just go, you know, from level one to, you know, through two to three. You might, you know, have to go back to two at one point or another. And the, I suppose that more or less covers that. So yes, the the station is run by the Corporation Trioptimum, which works on genetics and weapon research and development. And when you are caught hacking in, the executive makes a deal with you. If you remove the ethical constraints from the main computer, he will give you a cybernetic... I think it's like cyber interface implant, some, something like that. It'll enable you to go into cyberspace and a, yeah, there, there are various benefits to it. It gives you, it explains the inventory and it makes you able to retrieve, store and access data. And you, you know, you take this deal and the the surgery implanting this implant leaves you in a coma for six months, recovering. And when you wake up, immediately something is very wrong. With the ethical constraints removed, the AI known as Shodan, the sentient hyper-optimized data access network, let's be honest, they they came up with a cool name and then made abbreviation to to fit this is that is that is how these things are done it has this haunting creepy voice and she sees herself as god and she is going to alter make and mold life in her image and how she wants it and in addition to robots she creates these cyborgs and mutants and sends them towards you and she wasn't able to kill you during the six months because it was or able she didn't really think you were a threat it's just you know you weren't a soldier or something you just you know a visitor of the station almost and she will see you through the destroyable video cameras and also notice if you go into locked off areas. She already shot down one shuttle approaching the station and pretty much everything but you, pretty much everyone on the station except for you is dead or has been converted into one of her troops. You are the only person left to stop her, and it certainly makes sense that the hacker who created her is the one to also 
defeat her, but it is going to be a fight. There is no NPC interaction and there's no dialogue trees. The plot is told through emails, some from Shodan and some from Rebecca, who is back on Earth. And she, she basically sent a number of emails that would, you know, that you could then hear when you access certain areas because, you know, Shodan is blocking communication. And, yeah, so through these emails and through audio logs from the now dead, you know, workers of the station. And this is sort of a... And, and these audio logs tell the story of what has happened before. And this means that it's not so set in, in video game kind of situations. You're not, you know, always when you have like dialogue options, it's like, well, why can't I say this other thing? Or why do I have to say this thing? That's not an issue here. The developers were trying to remove the distinction between exploration and plot, but they did admit that on some level this is still a dungeon simulator. A lot of the setup for the stories in the manual, this was back when that was the case, now you basically don't communicate with anyone else. You, you receive messages but can't respond. That's also part of the... Actually, I'm not... I, I think there's an explanation. I don't remember exactly what it is, but why you can't, for example, respond to Shodan when she sends you an email. Now, I guess you have to be at a computer or something and you're only, like, trans you know, receiving. Anyway, the, the story is great, and I will say, I mean, I've played the second one countless times, and only just now, for the first time, played this one. And the second one does stand on its own. You, I mean, there's plot here that, you know, is good for, for setup and such, but, yeah, you can play the second one without having played this one. Now, the... This is very much in the genre of cyberpunk, which is sci-fi showing dark future wor futuristic worlds where information is extremely valuable. Cybernetic augmentation is common, and that's very much the case here. All computers are connected globally. Yeah, the, the genre of cyberpunk predates the internet. It kind of predicted the internet. You know, t today, saying that, you know, computers are linked globally. Yeah, internet. Most people live in urban areas. Corporations have a lot of power, including influence in governments, and genetic manipulation has been refined. Also very much present, genetic ma manipulation. And rebellion against centralized authority is rebellion against authority is central to the genre. And yeah, some of these things don't fully apply here or to the second one. Some of them more to Deus Ex, actually. Now, this is a first-person shooter action adventure with some RPG elements. It is a, a hybrid. None of these genre definitions completely encompass this by itself. Also very much the case with the second and Deus Ex. Some of the RPG elements include boosts that, you know, they might heal you, they might change your stats in, you know, some way or another. You have separate ammo types for the guns, many of the guns, and you can use hardware which drains energy and I, I will get more into each of these there is no unlike the second one there is no custom character characterization customization of characters yeah basically you didn't you don't get to choose you know separate upgrades you know which enable you to use specific guns 
specific armor implants you know where some of them yeah with with limited amount of points you can assign so you can't do everything in this you basically if you find everything you can use everything and and, and system shock 2 also has psi the psi and implants here are sort of the excuse me the hardware and I suppose that covers that. Now this one was a major breakthrough for the genre and spiritual successors include Deus Ex and Bioshock. It has been noted that there is not really a sense of urgency in this game but the, the pacing is great, it's very riveting and addictive. Now in this game you're very isolated you know there are no people around you know it's tense it's terrifying it's very atmospheric just even very early on you know that you are alone in this place like when a blast door opens or closes especially when it closes behind you even though you are the one who just you know, you know that there's it's not someone else opening the door you know talk about opening the door it's you. You just went through a door and you can hear it closing. That's supposed to happen, but it's still terrifying. It's it's very much a haunted house in space. Now, and when you look out windows, you can just see the vastness of space, stars and such. Not quite as much as the second one, but, but still. It's very much like Fortress 2, if it were any good. Fortress in space. Now... Or as you walk around the station, you find signs of the battle between the human beings and the mutants and cyborgs. There are body parts, there are messages on the walls in blood, you know, stay away, stuff like that. There are burns on walls and such from energy weapons, machines have been destroyed and such. And like Thief 1 and 2, the themes in this and the second System Shock game are, you know, there are some of the same themes, but there are, you know, there are some different perspectives on it. It's not, it's not a retread thematically. In, in both of these, in both System Shock games, it is very much the organic versus the mechanic, man versus machine. And like with the other three games I've just mentioned, neither extreme is presented as positive. You know, on the organic side, you have these violent and insane mutants. And on the side of the mechanic, you have this AI who is utterly indifferent to human suffering and who turns, who makes soldiers of men. And, you know, when I first noted that, I, I thought, well, you know, cyborgs. That also goes for the mutants, you know, she is just, she's removing their humanity. And, yeah, it's it's very nicely done. I, I love how Looking Glass did that in all four games. Now, the this is the first game with the engine for this game, and the engine was built specifically for it. The complex gameplay here is innovative and influential. This very much has emergent gameplay. You, you know, you can affect things that you don't have to, making the world feel alive. It reacts to your presence. You know, you can pick stuff up that you can't use anywhere and just, you know, look at it, maybe throw it or something, you know. An early example I've already mentioned you find, you know, body parts left over from fights. You can pick up severed limbs and throw them if you like. Yeah. Now, and this is very much, you know, there's linear progression through the objectives. You know, you might find a door that you're supposed to be able to go through, but it's locked from the other side, maybe you need an access card, maybe there's a puzzle unlocking it, maybe there's a keypad which you need to find the code for, you know, you pick up objects, 
objective items in one place and then have to use them in another yeah going going beyond just the the first person shooter can you know keep in mind at at this time in first person shooters you know picking something up and using it so we're just talking colored keys you know we're talking what is it silver and gold keys in Wolfenstein and there's like I think three color keys in the Doom games you know here you also have to make sure you have room in your inventory for the objective items and finding an objective item doesn't mean that you can instantly tell where you're supposed to use it or when now so yeah, a lot of these you know nonlinear progression and emergent gameplay, we take these things for granted today. And frankly, there are plenty of new games that don't do it right. Now, the you know in addition to you know the severed limbs you already find, there are other gore aspects of this. Some of the kill animations for the enemies are like beheadings and such. And the gameplay is, you know, you're exploring, you're fighting, and you're solving puzzles. And Shodan will block your progress and set traps, and these can get really frustrating and challenging. And this is where I have to get into some of the negatives. I, I hope what I've said so far has really sold you on this game, because this... Yeah, this this does bring me into. This is an awesome game in many respects, but it is really frustrating because of a few specific aspects. A lot of it is the controls and the HUD. Basically, interacting with stuff, you use the mouse, but you don't use the mouse to look up and down or to the sides. You can, I'll get more into that, but it's not the free 360 degree camera that, you know, again, this was back when first person shooters did not really use the mouse for looking around. You know, you basically just used the keyboard, or if you looked up and down, you also used keys for that. Yeah. And basically, when you when you left click with the mouse you activate something when you right click you shoot or throw something using the cursor to aim and there are a lot of keys to learn and memorize make sure to read the manual and there's very little safe tutorial and not really replayable tutorial and some of these keys are very different from the typical first-person shooter WSAD or just, you know, directional keys. And a lot of these keys are very counterintuitive. Basically, you can use the directional keys with control and alt for the, you know, alt for, for strafing and such. Very common to the genre. From, back then, but you do have to use the WSAD keys, not necessarily for, you know, the four directions, but you, yeah, basically, I'll, I'll cover that briefly, but I don't understand why they didn't just use WSAD with control and all, that would have made it a lot easier. Basically, crouch, prone, and lean are really annoying and awkward to use and you do really have to use crouch prone and yeah that's where the directional keys really don't cut it because the crouch prone and you know stand straight up I think it's like T H and B something T H and B something like that and yeah, I, I think just saying that, you can probably hear that that's kind of awkward. I, I don't really know why they didn't have some kind of other... Yeah. Now, the... And, and the, you know, the number keys above, at, at the top of the keyboard, 1 through 10, 1 through 9, 0, I suppose, are for hardware, not gun selection. You, you can 
you know, go through the the weapons with the keyboard, but it's like tab for forward through the guns and shift tab for backwards through the guns, which again, you know, you want to be using WSAD for that. I, I really hate to have to say it, but of these four games, Thief 1 and 2, and these two System Shock games, this is the least accessible, and it's not only today that that's the case. Now, basically, with the mouse, you interact, you use your inventory, and you fire, and the rest is for the keyboard. And technically, I mean, the manual says it's primarily a mouse-driven game. Technically, you can use the mouse for pretty much everything. I think jumping is still specifically on on the keyboard, but yeah, everything else. But it's it's very awkward to be using the mouse to move. And in, in general, I mean, again, just just saying it out loud, using your mouse and not the keyboard for a first person shooter that just doesn't make sense. Basically, to move with the mouse. You point to the edge of the, you know, the in-game screen, and you press and hold left click to turn, strafe, move forward or backward, those kinds of things. Yeah, doing that and shooting and using inventory, it's just, you know, yeah, it's it's pretty ridiculous. I use the keyboard for most of this. Most people probably are. Now the so so yeah basically it's 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 especially the the crouching and some also the strafing that really get in the way of comfortable playing using these controls. I've already mentioned the crouch prone stuff. Strafing is on. Z and I don't remember if it's X or Z, C, but yeah, again, that's just awkward. Again, I, I I appreciate that this was before left and right meant straight left and right. You know, I, I remember when these games came out and you were like, okay, hold down Alt, and which again, you can't do with WSAD in this. You have to use the you know the directional keys and if you're trying to also you know crouch and prone yeah and the you know and walking forward is not w it's s yes and x is backward yeah just even giving examples this sounds mind-boggling and yeah, these are really where, I mean, it takes ages to get used to it, and it's never quite comfortable. Now, the, yes, and the big, detailed, and complicated HUD takes a lot of getting used to. And I mean, at any time in this, you can open a menu that shows the titles of all the different areas, but yeah, it's still just not... You, you can minimize most of it so it doesn't overwhelm, but there are too many separate sections. Guns and carried items have separate menus, where in System Shock 2 and, you know, Deus Ex and so on and so on, you have one menu that covers everything that is, you know, that takes up space. You know, access cards don't take up space. But, yeah. And it's a... What, what in System Shock 2 is, you know, in System Shock 2, if you point to something and you're close enough, it will tell you what it is. In this, you have to click on it once to be told what it is. And thus, in System Shock 2, you click once to activate whatever you're pointing at. And in this, you have to double click because the first click just told you what it was. And it's... Yeah, and then there's a bunch of drag and drop, and that's, you know, that is common to these kinds of, you know, that again goes into these RPG elements of these games that, yeah, drag and drop for inventory, such and such. But 
where, again, System Shock 2, if you want to pick something up, you can just click on it and it'll be added to your inventory. Here, you have to click on it, double click on it, pull it into your inventory, and then click again. And as you're doing that, you have to be very careful that where you're clicking doesn't suddenly disappear as an inventory. Again, you can minimize pretty much everything in your inventory and that you don't accidentally double click on something in your inventory which then activates it and that can be a grenade for example yeah I, just, I, I don't think they really fully thought it through and again I, I hate to have to say that because there is so much good in this game but the the interface is one of the most important aspects it's you know that thing they say about if a relationship you know, if the sex in a relationship is good, it's 5%. If it's bad, it's 95%. It's kind of the same in games for interface and, yeah, these these kinds of things. Now, it's... Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, all of this would be fine if it, if it wasn't real-time fighting, but it is if it was turn-based. I mean... I have limited experience with RPGs. Straight RPGs don't really appeal to me that much, but I do love these games that have just aspects of it, and I appreciate it. that must be really frustrating to people who like RPGs the way they are, and now, you know, those of us who don't play RPGs are enjoying those elements without bothering with the rest of it. And again, I've I've limited experience with RPGs, but one I've played is Septera Core, which I rather like. All of the fighting in Septera Core is turn-based, so the fact that you have to spend several seconds bringing up the gun you want to use, or the magic, or whatever, is fine, because nothing's gonna happen while you're doing that. And in this, yeah, you could be Maybe you're being attacked, maybe you're running through a radioactive area, maybe you're also trying to, you know, there's there's a puzzle you also have to try to focus on. It just, it's, it's too much to also have this. And again, it's, they learn from this. They, they, I mean, System Shock 2 is much easier. The Thief games, also much, much, you know, easier. They're more comfortable to use. They're not necessarily... These are all hard games. These are all challenging games. But the... I suppose that more or less covers that. Now, I've already mentioned that you... that the inventory might disappear or accidentally be minimized. This is because when you first bring something up and bring it to the... That's again the thing. You have to... Once you're dragging and dropping, you have to double click on your inventory, on some part of your inventory to dump it there and when you, let's say you just checked a body for something, you pick something up from the body if there is more than one thing in there then the first time you've dropped something in your inventory the inventory might completely minimize before you drop the second thing and this again just, yeah, they, they hadn't fully thought it through or fully, which, I mean, I sympathize. This is, some of these things, this is the first game for some of these things, or one of the first games, so, you know, you, yeah, it's just, it's unfortunate that they didn't suss all this stuff out in developing the game so that the final product is, yeah. Now, I suppose that more or less covers that, but yeah, it is worth noting that, you know, running, strafing, jumping, crouching, and leaning is all possible in this, and you can't in all the peers of this, you know, this, this was around when looking up and down was just getting into these games, and certainly 
lean I haven't seen in very many of these games and I mean I didn't use it very much in this one I used it much more in the second one but that's uh, here it's Q and E and then W is you know center it it brings you back to the the main uh, yeah and it was just I was having trouble enough with strafing and yeah now yeah, as, as an example, Doom is much more accessible, and the two have a number of things in common. Dark, disturbing sci-fi with enemies that are scary, some even grotesque, some very spider-like. And Spoonie has said this is one of the scariest games he ever played on the PC, and I can see why. He, he specifically even said that this more than the second one had him scared of what he would run into on the next level and yeah that's that's very true and that's not because I'm like desensitized to the ones in the second one not at all I'm I'm very familiar with them but they still terrify me now you another thing with the interfaces in this you have to click directly on you know, most doors. Some have buttons, but most doors you click directly on. And some of these doors are more or less see-through, which is really annoying when you have to, you know, when you're in a hurry. But yeah, there, there are, you know, doors in this that are like force doors, and it's basically like an X of energy. And if you click anywhere but the X, more or less, it's not going to, you know, and some of them are pretty much entirely see-through, where it's just like a bunch of lines, you know, the, the power of, yeah, a bunch of, you know, intersecting lines, and yeah, it's, and, and again, this happens, you, you have to sometimes rush through these. Now, it also doesn't highlight what you can interact with, again, unlike System Shock 2 and Deus Ex. So, a bunch of things you click on, you know, again, you, you click on it once to be told what it even is, and then you double click to be, you know, to figure out if you can use it, and then it, you know, if it's something you can't use, it'll then say, can't, you know, let's say it's, it's a plant, can't use plant, you know, and then you have to wonder if some of the responses there are just funny by accident or intentionally funny the same way you know some some entirely text based you know some some of them graphics some purely text like like Zork I, I wanna say Zork I, I don't think I ever played the full one I'm not that into adventure but yeah you know you could you you type in what you want the character to do and if you like type something that you know yeah, if if you type actually, I think it's, I think it's a game called what was it Hugo Two Who Done It something like that, where you know if after a while you just get frustrated and you know you're trying to make the character open the door and he keeps saying it won't open the door for whatever reason and you just get so frustrated you just type open the expletive deleted door and then it won't say can't do that it'll say getting frustrated are we. I have to wonder if that's what happened here because some of these like it'll say the if you if you find a broken clock you know it'll say can't use broken clock I'm like still write twice a day you know there there might be words on a wall you know just like you know try optimum it might say you know double click on them can't use words that's very appropriate since you can't actually speak in this game, you know, can't use painting. I made you an art critic, and and then there are some, you know, some of these, you know, threatening words written in blood, like die, and it's like, I'm getting there. I'm I'm just not in a hurry to get there. Now, it, and and in this you can have two readouts open for inventory, but then if you do something, you know. If you do something to make it open a different readout, again, this can be checking a corpse. It'll, yeah, remove one of the readouts. And then if you try to, 
you know, if you want the one of those readouts back, you then have to try to find that readout, and you might even have trouble picking the readout. Again, you can have two. Yeah, if you want to have two open and it puts away one of them and then you try to reopen it, it might just put it on the other one. There's like one on the, well, this is my left, this is your right. One on the right, one on the left. And it'll often just, you know, the one on the right, one on the left, your left, will, will be, you know, close and it'll open something else. And then, you know, you try to click the thing, come back on, and then it'll still have the wrong one on the left one, and then the right one will have the one you wanted on the left one, so, yeah. Now, that more or less covers that. And then there are some small platforms which you can kind of climb and it'll, like, smoothly bring you to the top, very escalator and... Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I quite like that aspect of these four looking glass games. It's, yeah, I, I wish more games would, would do that instead of just, yeah, various other options that, and, and a lot of games that just don't allow that, where you're like, why can't I get up there? It's like nothing, you know, why can't I jump just that? little bit or climb that little bit but yeah of course growing up on commander keen games I'm like you should be able to grab on and then climb up so I have a soft spot for that kind of thing now with that said ladders in this again this was you know this was before grabbing a ladder meant grabbing a ladder in this and in others from this the time you know you point up and then you press up, you press forward to, you know, be climbing the ladder, unfortunately. In this, you also have to jump. And then sometimes, because you're, you know, going, yeah, sometimes it'll go to the side, and then you have to turn it back to the other side. If you turn it too much, whoops, fall down, have to start all over again. Yeah. <laughs> again, if they just didn't, if they didn't need you to jump, because typically in these games, again, the thing is, if you let go of the jump key while you're on a ladder, he will let go and fall off the ladder. Yeah, and this, you know, compared to like you know, Half-Life or s stuff like that, yeah, it's just up or down, and yeah. And then you have the double jumps, the run and jump, and these are just you know, you're, you're trying to do one, then you accidentally do another. Sometimes you're supposed to do one, sometimes the other, sometimes you can't at all. I, I just wish they had, you know, picked one and, and kind of stuck to it, which, again, they do in the second one. Now, in this, you can enter cyberspace. This was, again, I haven't played a lot of games from this period that did allow you to go into cyberspace, but... This and what's it called? Beneath a Steel Sky, which I also recently played. Yeah, you can enter cyberspace and it's visually represented. Again, this was back when that was the you know idea of what the internet would be. And yeah, it's it's very William Gibson. If you do not know who William Gibson is and you do know what cyberpunk is, then yeah, that is that is something you need to rectify but yeah it's you know you're, you're standing still in real life but you're in this wireframe environment and it's basically a flight simulator and you're using the WSA, WASD keys and you have to watch out from mines you navigate around mines you have to shoot and avoid being shot by these cyber guards of, of different kinds some of them look like a pit bull you know in just yeah, and you fly down corridors and the rooms that they link together. It's not as challenging as the main game, and sometimes you can find, you know, sometimes you can do something in cyberspace that unlocks something in real life, such as opening a door in there, and, you know, again, much like Beneath the Steel Sky, and yeah, and, and find information in there. You might find, 
you know, I mentioned keypads, maybe you'll find a, you know, the, the combination for a keypad in there. And to enter, you have to find a console and then discreetly jack on. If you die in cyberspace, you become fatigued. And I think it also cuts down the time limit on it. But I'm not going to claim that I didn't die very often, but I did usually load and then, yeah. Now, in System Shock 2, hacking is just connecting dots. You know, I say just, it's, yeah, that's what they went for. It's not bad, but yeah, and you, you don't have to do it as much as you have to here. You very much have to hack in this game. And it also, in part, is that in this game you are playing a hacker, where in the second one, you are customizing your character, so you you can choose to be a good hacker, but you know you can also choose to you know not do the hacking, not not focus on the hacking very much. Now, the in in this the puzzles tend to be mini games, such as the you know connecting lines like the System Shock Two hacking. You know, maybe you have to, you know, set a specific path between two points, and it's it's difficult to explain. It's minesweeper kind of thing, yeah. And you know, there there are some where you have to reconfigure wires, and basically there are let's say there are four points on both sides. And there are wires between them, and they can go direct between points, and they can go diagonally. And you have to try, you know, aligning the these wires in the right way to short circuit it. I, I think that's basically what you're doing. And when when you face enemies, the the guns and the ammo you use to, on them, you know, are specific to they they deal a specific type of damage again very unlike these other, you know, other first-person shooters from this time. So, you know, if you have an EMP or energy weapon, maybe use it on robots, whereas gas and such is good for mutants. And the enemies are truly horrifying. You can tell that they used to be, you know, a regular sentient being. They, they used to be human, or they used to be an animal. I mean... They're, they've they've merged together some animals in this. It's yeah, and and yet still no pigeon rat. I, I I just really feel like there's 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 something there that that could really be mined, and yeah, and you can tell they're not just like mindless. They're sentient. Some of them die with a brutal roar, and there are many different types. But they don't really repeat, you know, the between here and System Shock 2, they don't really repeat the, the same ones. There are similar motifs, but they're distinct. And again, both games, cyborgs, robots, and mutants or organic kind of, yeah. I'm not going to give away what it is in the second one. Now, the... Some of the enemies you can lure from where they start out to, you know, it's, yeah, to, to help you fight them, you know, to lure them. Like, let's say you have a corner you can hide behind, and they're, like, down a hallway. You can peek out it's just enough that they see you and then run at you, and then you, you know, hide behind the corner. If they walk all the way up, you can just turn the corner and attack them you know, instead of having to fight them from a, you know, and that's also a way you can do, you know, the the martial arts showdown in a movie kind of thing where they'll come at you just one at a time. And there, there are definitely times where you, you know, you'll at least want to consider running away from the enemies. Of course, if you have to go past, if you have to go through that hallway once again they're still gonna be there so 
at some point, it, either at some point you'll have to kill them, or you're going to have to keep running every time you go past there. So, yeah. And a number of these enemies, even if you don't see them, you can recognize them by the sound. The, the sound of their attack, or the sound of, you know, again, some of them give off noises. The, the robots, of course, you can hear the mechanic kind of, you know, whirring, clicking. Mutants might give off horrifying screams. Yeah. Some of the enemies can fly, some of them can shoot, some of them can do both. And there are some of them that are very, very dangerous. And when you're facing the cyborgs, you know these are the former crew of the station. These are not, you know, these these guys do not deserve to die. They didn't. They do not deserve to have been, you know, turned into this depraved, sick thing. But you have to kill them. Maybe maybe you're even releasing them from a horrible life, you know, by killing them. Yeah, and. As far as boss fights go in this, not too bad, but not like, yeah, they're, they're, they're okay, kind of. And that brings me to the guns. There are a total of 16 guns in this, and you can only carry 7 at a time. Again, distinguishing it from, you know, first person shooters of the time. And unlike System Shock 2 and Deus Ex, you don't choose between carrying more guns and more items. Again, they have separate menus. Now, the guns include pistols, assault rifle, SMGs, and, and you have this, you start off with a pipe for just bashing them, which you'll, you'll want to conserve ammo because some of the enemies are really tough and ammo can be somewhat sparse and you know it's also if you don't explore a lot or if you don't kill a lot of enemies you might not be able to find very much ammo that's that's how you find ammo you know it'll be on corpses including of the ones you've killed or you know maybe there, there are like stocks of ammo that you know the the survivors you know it didn't happen overnight there was a fight here so some of the survivors you know, in, in the audio logs, you'll also hear, like, plans they attempted or something. They're, they were like, I know if I could just do this, it would be good, but how do I do that? And then you have to find out, how do you do that? But, yeah, and, yeah, they, they hid a number of weapons and such. And, you know, the cyborgs aren't necessarily going to care about that. The, you know, they don't need to use the weapons that the humans used, and they were winning. So, yeah. Now, you also have some EMP and energy weapons, and on the energy weapons, you can adjust the amount of heat. There's like a slider at the bottom of the screen. And the, the hotter it is, the more energy it uses, which is the same as the hardware it uses, and the fewer shots you can fire off before the gun overheats and, or, yeah, gets gets very hot and then can't shoot for a while. And the, and of course the hotter, the, the energy shot, the more, the more powerful the, it will also be. Now, you also have explosives, including mines, hand grenades, some of them timed, and you, again, have a slider. You can set it from, you can set it somewhere between 1 second and 57 seconds. So, yeah, that's very cool. You can set traps like that if you want. And, yeah, you don't want to hold on to a live grenade. And grenades include EMP, gas, frag, concussive, and basically, you choose what to carry and when to use it, but not, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you don't have to upgrade things in order to be, to be able to use certain weapons or to be better at using certain weapons. Now, but, but yeah, for, for ammo and barrel guns, you know, keep exploring, keep killing enemies, check containers, bodies, Look hard, and you may find 
supplies. You can save any time except in cyberspace where there's also a time limit. And the there are four difficulty settings for each of the four, you know, the, the four including or the four being combat, mission, cyber, and puzzles. Cyber being cyberspace and yeah, I yeah, I think those are more or less straightforward. On the highest difficulty setting for mission, you have a seven hour time limit. Yeah. Now, to put this in perspective, this was the first time I played this, so, you know, maybe if I played more times, I would be able to get better and maybe eventually, but this took me 24 hours. So, yeah. <laughs> it's probably a good thing I did not take the, the highest difficulty settings. And yeah, choosing separate difficulty settings for separate things is very much like you know some of the Silent Hill games where you know puzzles and and combat and such. So yeah, that's always a, a plus for games. And even if you play it on easy, it's going to be challenging right from the start. And you know, yes, you can save any time, but you'll need that and skill to, to get through this. You know, that's always a thing where, you know, if you can save any time, then can't you just, you know, try out and then see how things happen and then figure out how to properly do it. In this, even doing that, you'll still have to be really fast and really, you know, excuse me, go, yeah, do well at the first person shooting, do well at, yeah, and if you rush ahead in this, you will die. Even early on, you meet some enemies that, for the time at least, are tough. Now, some... And yeah, when you enter a new area, you'll want to check for both a camera and potential enemies and be ready to fight, be ready to flee as well. And some of these security cameras, if you haven't destroyed them and you find a monitor that shows, yeah, what, what they're showing, then you can use that to get an idea of where to go, what to do, so, yeah. Now, and if you die, I love when games do this, if you die, you will see what happens. And basically, your body is harvested for use as a cyborg for Shodan. It, it says, as a cyborg, you will serve Shodan well. Yeah, this is of course unless you, on that level of the station, have found a healing station which basically resurrects you. And, you know, in that case, you won't lose particularly much by dying, but even doing that and then, like, going war of attrition on the enemy, it can still be kind of difficult. I mean, Personally, I'd say it's it's more efficient to just, you know, be fully prepared and then go in and fight. And if you need to, you know, save before and then load after, but yeah, especially some of the traps. It's just, yeah, if you can handle it in one, it's, it's yeah, probably better. And again, when you reach a new level of the station, you have to then find and activate this healing station. Otherwise, if or when you die, you'll be harvested as a cyborg. So, yeah. Now, the this allows you to use dermal patches, which have, you know, each one benefit. And this includes regeneration, more attack power for melee, which again enables you to save ammo and some of them you know they can also cause negative effects especially if you use them for you know yeah like you use them and then after the effect has worn off which you know a minute or so you know yeah then you suffer the negative effects and then you really don't want to be in a bad spot like the one that gives you more you know more stamina makes you extremely fatigued when it runs out. 
you know, one of them distorts the color. One of them is called reflex, which basically puts everything in slow-mo, which can give you the extra edge for tough enemies. And of course, and, and traps. And of course, some of these are very hard to come by. So yeah. And that brings me to the hardware. These include an energy shield, night vision, a head-mounted lantern, and this can be really useful for some areas are dark, some are pitch black, and in general, in this game, you will find areas that you're not yet ready for. Maybe it's dark and you don't have a lamp. Maybe there's an enemy that you're not yet able to defeat. Maybe, yeah, there's things, and you know, you have to maybe find a way around, find some equipment that will allow you to go there. You know, one of the earliest hardwares, I think it might be the first, allows you to look behind you, and then at first, it updates, like, I think maybe every second or so. So, yeah, it's not instantaneous right from the start, but then as you progress through the game, you get better versions of these. Now, that... I may have already mentioned the hardware uses the same energy as the energy guns. So, you know, you can't use them all the time. And this is a lot like, you know, the augmentations of Deus Ex, which I would say has more interesting ones than this. I, you know, some of the hardware in this is more or less just, you know, yeah, like a shield or a light. And this is, you know, where, like, by the time we got to Half-Life, shield was something you, well, yeah, armor was something you picked up in other of these games. And, yeah, Half-Life just straight up gives you a flashlight. And then there's battery that you have to, but, yeah, it, it just feels like, you know, if it's something you're attaching to your body, you maybe think of some cooler ones, but some of them are interesting. And again, Deus Ex did come out later and could build on what was achieved here. I do want to make that distinction, you know, when whenever I compare it to these. I'm trying to not be unfair because obviously this was the first, you know, they did and there's always, you know, and one of the first of this kind and which accomplished these things. So, of course, it's not going to be as high as, and, and certainly, it's a very challenging game, it's, the atmosphere is great, yeah, there's, there's still awesome stuff. Now, in some ways, this is like Thief 1 and 2, you don't choose upgrades, but you choose equipment, which in this is guns and hardware, and in Thief 1 and 2 are special arrows, and these have intended uses and strengths and weaknesses. Now, because, like I said, you you know, you do have to, you know, with guns and items for your inventory, you do have to choose. You only have seven, you know, spots for it and slots for it. Now, but, but yeah, unlike Deus Ex and System Shock 2, you don't have, like, a limited amount of points that you, you know, you can't upgrade everything in those games. Here, if you find all the upgraded versions of them, then, yeah, you can upgrade all the hardware. Now, objects you find and pick up are somewhat randomized, so, again, you know, if you die and, you know, or if you load and such, the next time you try that same corpse or such, it might have very different items. So that's very cool. And that, again, is something that randomization within a certain... Yeah, as long as it doesn't go too far, is a great thing for games. That's why if... All in all, Alien vs. Predator 2 is better than Alien vs. Predator 1. It, you know, the story's actually there, and the stories affect each other, and the the three species are more 
fair when compared to each other, but playing Alien vs. Predator 2 in single player gets very repetitive because you've already done it. You know, once you've you you basically yeah the the enemies will spawn in the same places and the it might have very predetermined behavior. Alien vs. Predator one. Yeah, you know, when, when you approach the same place, it might have, like, two or three low-level enemies or one high-level enemy. You just don't know until you're seeing it. And, yeah, that's always a good thing to make it more, you know, yeah, make it unpredictable. Now, you, you have 14 slots. I might have said before you had seven, sorry about that. You have 14 slots for items, and these include med kit, battery, you know, there are also these items that you don't really, you also, this is also where you have objective items, and I'm not going to give away what those are, but you also have, like, more or less useless stuff in, in this one, and you can just toss that, or, you know, yeah. And, and I think it will always tell you, I think it's like green text, means that you can use it for something or maybe you even need it. Red text means it's completely pointless. So, yeah. Now, yeah, the, the battery recharges the energy used for hardware and energy weapons. And there are also these power stations which will refill your energy entirely. But then they do need to regenerate the power, which it doesn't take long, but just don't try to camp out by one and then go nuts with using energy. Yeah, it's not going to... They, they thought about these things. Now... That more, yeah, and then the there are seven grenade types, seven dermal patch types, and the... the patch types include stamina, healing, Detox, which removes the effect of any dermal patch, as well as radiation and such. So, yeah, good uses there. You know, one that improves your vision, which, you know, if you don't yet have, like, night vision or a lantern, maybe vision can help, but, yeah, not... Don't rely on it too much. You know, that's that's... That's the thing for this game. Don't rely on anything too much. You you still need to, you know, you might run out of ammo, run out of energy. Maybe there's some kind of, yeah. And that, again, that it keeps you on your toes. And then there's a normal patch called Genius, which makes solving puzzles easier. Now, the... Let's see, the... Yeah, the the fatigue means you you know you move slower and you have to stand still until your stamina refills. It's a lot like sprinting in more recent games, but if you don't run a lot, you just won't notice it. Frankly, for um for a lot of this game, I did not notice it at all. Now that's also you know in the inventory and such. The some of the displays, some of the yeah, some of the things it keeps track of, I didn't find myself looking at all of them. One of them was the fatigue thing, and yeah, I mostly just didn't really run unless I really had to. And, and that's, again, that's something you really have. I hate to say it, but some people are going to look at this game and just say, you know what, this is way too involved. And, yeah, I mean... I have to be honest, if I didn't already love this franchise, if I didn't if I didn't love the second one and and know that this was made by the same people, then I might not have played, you know, beyond the first half hour or so, because there's just so much you have to pay attention to, and so much of it that you have to pay attention to in real time. Again, you know, it's not I, I, again, I haven't played a lot of RPGs, but I do remember in, like, Septera Core, if you were just, like, standing still and making sure to heal people, yeah, you could find a spot where the enemies wouldn't come to, or if you were just fought in, a, in an area, if you stay in that area, 
you might be safe from more enemies. The, the enemies will be there when you move a little further or something like that, or if you activate something that brings out enemies. And yeah, that's just not the case here. Now, you can... there there is a speed booster which allows you to skate. It makes things very bouncy basically and you know somewhat does the yeah some sometimes in general when you move fast and that's the same for other looking glass titles personally I I prefer to avoid that I find it just makes it more difficult to maneuver which might also be why I didn't run so much in this you can find a game player which allows you to play Pong a game that's basically Missile Command, DX Ball, I, I know, DX Ball wasn't the original, DX Ball is the one I'm familiar with, I, I I don't remember what the original was called, but also DX Ball rocks, so there's that. One of those puzzle slide games, you know, where there's one spot that doesn't have anything and you have to move the pieces to buy that one spot, yeah. Now... And this is based on the engine, or the engine here was later developed into the dark engine used for System Shock 2, Thief 1 and 2. And the 3D engine and physics simulation was innovative and influential with things like gun recoil and the arc of thrown objects being, yeah, actually predicted. It's not something that just, yeah, and that's, yeah, if you, if you take a fully automatic weapon in this game and you just keep firing eventually you know the gun is just gonna be impossible to keep track of again we take this for granted today but yeah play Wolfenstein play Doom you know, Wolfenstein 3D play Doom yeah it's just and yeah and the arc of thrown objects you know because yeah when you're throwing a grenade this is again you can throw grenades in like Duke Nukem, for example. Not saying Duke Nukem 3D is, is a bad game, don't get me wrong. From what I recall, at least, it doesn't quite really, you know, or maybe it just... Never mind, I'm not... It's been too long since I played that, and I don't remember which of these came out. That might have come out later, never mind. But but yeah, th thrown items move in an arc. You can, you can throw something close, you can throw something further away and different objects will behave differently if it's something light like a decapitated head you can throw it further ew now the the graphics and sound are solid for the time and they do work somewhat within their means there's not too much that the engine can't make look or sound good that they do you know this is always something that i i get that you have to push it far to improve in the long run, but games that live within, within their means and push it far just look better and are easier to return to. I love the original Prince of Persia. Again, grew up on this game. They knew that they couldn't make things look very, like, yeah, very high detail and very bright and, and pretty, so what is the game about? You're running around in a dungeon, so it's gray, black, and you've got, you know, the, the torches, which also look really good. And there are parts of it that are more, like, bright, like, golden, golden kind of thing, more palace-y kind of, but, yeah, the game works entirely within its means. And then you have other games where you can tell that they just couldn't make that look good yet. So, yeah. Now... With that said, there are some things that they try to do that doesn't that don't come out looking great. And of course, today it suffers pixelation on our larger monitors, and you know the resolution is yeah. Now some of the MIDI music and the sounds, some of them are hard on the ears, and that's not true of all MIDI music. Basically the higher notes can be very shrill. Now, this was early 3D, so some objects, you know, if you move around them, they will just spin on their axis. You know, again, these decapitated limbs and such, you can only see the face. So, yeah. 
Now, let's see. Yeah, I, I may have already mentioned that this is basically a haunted house in space. There's a sense of ever-present threat. You know, you don't have to, even if you're not seeing an enemy, if even if minutes pass without you seeing an enemy, which might happen if you're backtracking, for example. Again, you move back and forth through the different levels of the space station. Yeah, you might not see anything, but because of the music, because of how empty it is, you still get a sense that every, you know, any minute now, something could pop up. And it doesn't help that some of these, you know, mutants and robots do actually, yeah, basically, they might have been hiding somewhere and such. And do note, enemies spawn in this game. They, they, they keep spawning. Even if you think you've cleared a level, it might still come an enemy, and it might not even be because you've, you know, if you progress, then Shodan's going to send enemies to where, towards where she can tell you're headed. But even without that, they, they might still spawn. Again, keeping you on your toes. Now, the, the music changes depending on what you're doing. Again, very much fitting the it pretty much fits every situation, and at some points it's eerily silent. And it's this kind of techno and synth score with electric sounds. The cutscenes in this are simple and you know, simple in animation, kind of broad, you might say. Think like you know, original Command and Conquer, but they're also very detailed. Now. This has immersive environments, and pretty much everything on the station feels real. Like, you you look at something and you can tell it used to fully function. You know, you pass through offices, storage areas, you know. there There's one point where, you know, you're going through an area of futuristic fuse boxes. And I did not count them, but I bet Spoonie did. Now, at times the level layout can be very confusing and can be hard to tell where you're supposed to go. At times, I just used process of elimination. And to be fair, I've had trouble finding my way in other 90s first-person shooters. I think I don't have very good, what's that thing, 3D thinking, visualizing, yeah. Now... There are times where you're working on more than one objective, since you know one of them might require some equipment that you don't have yet. Now, the most abilities in this you can turn on and off, including the compass and the minimap. And yeah, the compass literally puts you know when you're looking in a direction right in front of you know. Yeah, it'll it'll say north, northwest, yeah, north by northwest, the uh, yeah, and and then you know the the mini map which fills in as you explore. You can also open a full map where you can actually place markers, giving them names, and you know, and and if like the names of a marker, if you've written. A name of a marker that's a little long and it starts to obscure the map. You can just there's there's a function to toggle between showing the messages and just showing where you placed the messages. So yeah, this is the kind of stuff that I love looking glass for. And the and you will also want to have a you know pen and pad of paper by you so that. Yeah, there are, there are a number of notes that you have to take in this. And I do, again, in the second one, they improved it. In the second one, since you already have the map, you were, you were working for a trioptimum in the second one. You know, you're really just, it's filling out a map that it also already kind of sort of, excuse me, knows so you can't see the details of the map before you go there, but when, once you go there, it will highlight, you know, this is where you can recharge, you know, energy, yeah, various things like that. 
I mean, this does show some things. It shows when you can go from one level to another, like if there's a ladder, for example, and it shows doors and elevators, but other than that, not much. And there are a lot of these things that you then, you know, have to place by yourself, you know, place markers on the map or, yeah. But, but the compass and the minimap help a lot in finding your way and in making sure you're headed the right way. Now, the, the final, you know, stage and final fight and such are cool enough. I'm not going to give them away. Not now, I suppose. And then, you know, there is this thing called online help, which really, you know, it points to anything you can interact with, either if you haven't interacted with it, yeah, if you haven't interacted with it at all, if you've interacted with it but and not gotten everything, that kind of thing. And it will also point to, and, and also you know, like enemies and you know telling you to attack, also hidden doors. Personally, I wish that it would purely point to like what you can interact with because there were times in this where I wasn't sure, again, it doesn't highlight it. So you might be pressing something. First time you press it, it'll just tell you what it is. Second time, you know, you double click it'll most of the time just tell you you can't use that. And yeah, there were times where I I was being careful and, you know, trying to click everything in a room because I knew there was supposed to be something in there that I was supposed to use, but I must have missed it and thus I just kept running past it and eventually I just said, okay, online help, at least for a little bit. And yeah, immediately point out this is the thing that you need to, so yeah. At, at least early on, it can be useful, and yeah, again, they, they did a lot better in the second one and such. Now, the and one of the things here is that you you sometimes get stuck stuck on objects, you know, walls. Just yeah, and that's again why I'm trying to avoid the bouncy suddenly you're stuck in an area that you, yeah, it, it takes some of the movement out of your control. And it's, yeah, one thing that this didn't do and that the later ones did is it didn't streamline enough. The things are a little, I mean, it makes sense that you click one time on something and then you're told what it is and then you double click to use it or such. I have played some adventure games, you know, yeah, that it makes sense for a straight adventure game, but it doesn't make sense for a first person shooter. So, yeah, but definitely all in all, it it's still worth playing for, you know, the atmosphere, the enemies, the story, just the 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 immersive experience of it. But just be be aware that the the controls and the HUD, these sorts of things get very frustrating. And it doesn't really, I mean, again, I've just completed it 24 hours. I never got quite comfortable with the number of the controls. And as far as I've been able to tell, you can't change them. This was also, you know, you couldn't always change controls back in these yeah, but yeah, I mean, I. It's looking glass. It's it's. Cyberpunk, where you know, thief is steampunk. When looking glass does something that ends in punk. I'm I'm there. It's it's just yeah. I've reviewed other parts of the series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment. And hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.